So, I don't know if you ever get a kind of spontaneous ticking noise in the back of your head. Kind of like a, a tick tock almost. And sometimes it seems to be right around 32,000 hertz. I don't know if that, that happens to you, but when it happens to me, I sometimes kind of wonder, what, what's going on? And so, um, you know, today is the day where you actually get to learn why that may be the case. Um, and if you feel that, for instance, February is traveling along and dragging along as if you were going three fourths the speed of light, uh, don't worry, you're not going that fast. Uh, you just need a refresher on class. Um, and Marty Schwartz is uh, the guy to tell you about it. Ever since Marty is small, he's been interacting with time. <laughs> and not, not only that, he's been using clocks ever since that, those early days. Um, from his search from big to small, uh, pendulums to atoms, from natural to, well, more natural, uh, without further ado, years in the making, Marty Schwartz, Nature as Clock. Thank you all for coming. Happy Valentine's Day, first of all. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk to you about the kind of time. And it's not the dilated, extraordinary time of relativity. And it's not the kind of arrow of time associated with thermodynamics. Instead, we're going to learn about this everyday time that we take for granted, that we use clocks for every day. Time you use to get here on time. <laughs> That's the time told by clocks. So why is this everyday technology so interesting? Well, when I think of technology, you mostly think of designs. So you design something, you put a bunch of things together, and you end up with a gizmo that happens to do what you want. In the case of clocks, however, you have a gizmo that relies on this fundamental physical phenomena known as a harmonic oscillator to tell its time. So rather than this totally man-made object, clocks rely on what I have come to decide are these kind of natural clocks, these harmonic oscillators. And all we're doing by making clocks is harnessing their power um, for our own convenience. So today we're going to look at the story of clocks and their intimate relationship with the harmonic oscillator. Um, hopefully you'll agree that nature has some beautiful clocks already there. So to start, we have to start with early clocks, which actually did not use harmonic oscillators. Um, so we have you know, sundials, which just told time from the passing of the sun, hourglasses, which is just uh, sand flowing continuously through a narrow opening, and of course we have a lot of water clocks, which is just you have water dripping through an opening at a somewhat constant rate. So to illustrate this, I built a little water clock. So we're going to top her off right here. <laughs> um, so if everything goes to plan, it should last about 15 minutes. So when it gets below this line, 15 minutes has elapsed. You'll notice this tape here is 25 minutes, and that's much more than halfway down to two. So that's to illustrate that these clocks are very inaccurate, and they slow down as the water pressure drops, right? So clearly, we need better clocks. Um, we don't want to be relying on these. And it's a good thing that we discovered harmonic oscillators, or else we would be very confused with time these days. So uh, how do we get past that point? Well, here comes Galileo. Galileo changed all of that. So Galileo, this is the 1600s, and he's sitting in a cathedral um, in his hometown, Pisa, Italy. And he's a teenager, so he's really bored by the sermon. He's just sitting there, he's not listening at all. Instead, he's watching this chandelier sway back and forth in the wind. So that's much more interesting to him than the sermon. And he's sitting there day after day, and he notices that when the wind is light, the chandelier doesn't swing very far. But when the wind is really heavy, it swings a lot further. And he notices something very peculiar. He thinks, wait a minute, the period of the chandelier seems to be independent of how far it swings. So intuitively, he thought that since the chandelier is going further on heavier windy days, that it would take longer to complete its swing. But in fact, he noticed that it took just, amount, just the same amount of time. And so he thought that can't be true. So he timed it with the most accurate clock he had on him at the time, which was his pulse. So he measured the, the length of the period of the pendulum with his pulse, and he noticed that it was exactly constant. So this was a huge discovery for him. He realized that here's the first system I've ever seen, this natural system that has a preferred uh, period, regardless of any external factors, such as the amplitude or the wind or anything. So nature kind of it set up the system that always wants to oscillate at this very preferred frequency. And he thought, well, we definitely should make a clock out of this, right? It's a natural clock. It just follows that we can make a good timekeeping device. So that's exactly what he did. He invented the first pendulum clock. And ever since then, all clocks have relied on a harmonic oscillator like the pendulum. Of course, the harmonic oscillator is kind of nature's clock, but we need to harness that and make it a human clock. So the second element of all the clocks since Galileo 
have involved some kind of mechanism to record the oscillations and turn it into a form that we understand as humans. So turn it into a form like this clock we have, you know, hands turning around. Of course, the third um, element of all clocks is a way to return energy to the oscillator. Because all systems, in reality, lose energy no matter what. Even if it seems like it's never going to lose energy, energy is always transferred from the system to the surroundings. So eventually, the clock will stop. We don't input energy at a, cons at a consistent rate to the oscillator. So these are three elements that all clocks use. Today we're going to look at four different categories. So from pendulum clocks, electronic clocks, quartz clocks, and finally atomic clocks. They all use vastly different physics to describe their mechanism. They all use vastly different harmonic oscillators, but yet they all have these three um, elements. So throughout my talk, if you're ever lost, just look at the top of the slide. You'll see either one, two, or three, and those numbers will correspond to one of these three elements. So, I mentioned the harmonic oscillator is a natural phenomenon. So if it's this, uni this fundamental natural phenomenon, we would think that there's some kind of mathematical formalism to describe all harmonic oscillators. And in fact, there is. So we're gonna break it down into two different components. They're all described by some kind of sine wave, and they're all described by a transfer between two different forms of energy. So keep these two components in mind. They're gonna keep coming back to us um, in all the harmonic oscillators we look at, and they're gonna be our dear friend in the next hour. So, Sebastian, you're walking down the street, right? <laughs> and you run into Doc Brown, and Doc Brown's really frazzled, and he says, Sebastian, I gotta get back to the future as quickly as possible. Can you please tell me the simplest form of harmonic oscillator you can think of? So I need to make this formalism. Mm -hmm. So what do you say? <laughs> trampling, yeah. So what, what makes the trampling work? <laughs> <laughs> What gives it its kind of bounciness? Could be springs. Yeah, a spring. <laughs> so the spring. A simple form of harmonic oscillator is a mass on a spring. Wow. So in simple form, it can trust it. It's going to make it back to the future indeed. So we have a mass on a spring here. We have a frictionless table and a horizontal um, spring. And notice when it's sitting here at its equilibrium position, it's at rest and nothing's happening. If we disturb it from an equilibrium position and pull it back, we extend the spring a little bit, the spring's gonna exert a force on the mass and pull it to the left. It's gonna move to the left and then compress the spring, then the spring's gonna wanna push it to the right, and pretty soon you can see these back and forth oscillations. So how do we describe this? How do we go from this kind of back and forth spring system to a constant period? Because that's, after all, what makes it useful for clocks. Well, we're gonna do a little bit of analysis of force here. So here we have Hooke's Law, which describes the force on the mass. Um, and you can see that it's opposite and proportional to this displacement. So the displacement just describes the distance of the mass x from its equilibrium <coughs> position here at x equals zero. We combine that with Newton's new second law, put it together, we get this beautiful double dot equation. So for those who aren't familiar, double dot just means the second derivative in time. And then if we solve this differential equation, we end up with the, our beautiful sine wave. So there it is. And then inside the sine wave, the argument of a sine wave, you have a period. Um, so that period is given by k over m. So don't worry too much about the math here. Just notice that what's in the circle are just k and n. And so those are intrinsic variables to the system itself. So k, k um, delineates the stiffness of the spring. So a stiffer spring will exert greater forces for a given displacement. And then m is the mass of the spring. It can, you can notice that the time it takes for the mass to swing back and forth only depends on those two factors. So wherever you take this mass and spring system, take from Minnesota, New Jersey, wherever you go, it's always gonna have the same period. And that's because this period only depends on these intrinsic factors. And that's what makes it such a useful timekeeper. So if you don't like math, let's look at this in graphical form. Here's our beautiful sine wave. X-axis we have time, and the y-axis we have what I call the primary variable. Um, so in this case, that's the displacement of the mass in horizontal displacement x. So here you can see it's positive, here you can see it's negative, and here it's in the middle of its path, it's zero. So if you look at it over time, you can see that it corresponds to this oscillating function back and forth across the equilibrium position zero. So just a quick refresher amplitude here just corresponds to the distance from the zero mark. Um, so the maximum amplitude is up here and the minimum is down here. That corresponds to these two different um, snapshots of the mass in time. So then where's our period? Well, there's our period, right? It's a difference between two feet. So I said there were two components to harmonic, harmonic oscillator. We figured where our sine wave and our period comes from, but what was the other one? Does anyone remember? Well, it was transfer. Yeah, energy transfer, right? So how are we gonna describe the energy of the simple harmonic oscillator? Well, we're gonna do it in this graphical form. 
So don't get too confused about lines here. Just keep in mind that on the y-axis we have energy, and on the x-axis is that displacement we looked at before, so going from positive to negative through zero. The total energy is given up here in this solid black line. And then we know that to get total energy, we add potential kinetic energy, and that's represented by these two curves here. You can see that they're kind of changing. Um, and since they always add up to total energy, the correspondence to how much each one contributes to the total energy is what's changing as displacement changing, changes. So let's, let's look at that, go back to our pendulum example, because it's easier to see. So if I give it an initial displacement and start it oscillating, you can see that it kind of traces out a curved path. And that curved path very nicely corresponds to our potential energy curve here. It's just a problem. So if you look at its bottom of its path, so that's right when it goes to the bottom here, we see that all the energy is stored in kinetic, because that's where it's moving its fastest. So the blue line, which corresponds to kinetic energy, is maximized. And its red line, which corresponds um, to potential energy, is zero, because it's at the bottom of its swing. In the opposite case, when it's all the way to the sides of its swing, you see it has some height, a little bit of height above its zero position. So it has some gravitational potential energy, and that's why you can see it, um, all the energy is in the potential energy up here. When it's all the way at the sides of its swing, you see it's turning around, so at that instant, it has zero velocity, right? And it has zero kinetic energy. And that's why down here, the blue line goes to zero. So you can kind of see, the point of this slide is to just show you kind of the dance between potential and kinetic. And in all the oscillators we're gonna see, we're gonna see this kind of same dance between two different forms of energy. It's not always gonna be potential and kinetic, but it's always gonna look somewhat like this. So what did we say before? We said all systems that are real lose energy. So that means that the total energy drops down and continues to drop until eventually it hits zero and our clock stops, and that's not good for anyone. So our goal here is to keep our total energy up here and not drop down. So we're gonna see how all the different clocks we look at accomplish this. Okay. So great, we've learned all the physics we need to for this mathematical formalism of the simple harmonic oscillator. We have our primary variable, which is x, our horizontal displacement, and we'll see that in all the subsequent oscillators, we're gonna see some kind of primary variable that oscillates over time. We have a defining equation that leads to our sine wave, and our sine wave, again, is gonna be primary variable on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. <coughs> this hooking constant, here's the spring constant, um, that's one of the variables that defines the period, so it's intrinsic to the system itself. In the case of the spring, that was the stiffness of the spring, so wherever you take the spring, that stiffness is gonna define the period, not any other factors. Um, of course, there's a natural period here, which comes out of the sine wave, and then our two energy forms, potential and kinetics. So in this case, the potential was stored in the spring and the kinetic is stored in the moving mass. Okay, great. Well, that's great, but let's talk about some clocks. You know, we haven't really divided that yet. So remember our three essential elements, our harmonic oscillator, our mechanism to record the oscillations, and our way to return energy back to the oscillator. So our first stop on our journey are pendulum clocks. The very first oscillating clocks ever invented. That's what Galileo invented years ago. This picture here is actually of um, the Riefler clock, which is one of the most precise pendulum clocks ever built, and luckily for us, we have one, and it's in the Olin lobby, so if you've ever gone into the main door of Olin, which I'm sure all of you have at some point, or you slept here, um, <laughs> you'll notice this beautiful clock here. So what is the harmonic oscillator in this clock? Well, of course, it's a pendulum. The mechanism to record the oscillations is called an escapement, and we'll look at that in a second. And then to return energy to the pendulum clock, we have falling weights. So you can't quite see them here, but there's weights that fall slowly, and as they fall, so there's energy stored in that potential energy of the weights, and as they fall, they transfer that energy to the clock. Of course, eventually they get to the bottom of their path, and someone has to wind the weights back up to the top of their path, so they can continue giving energy to the clock. So that's great. Let's go back to the physics of the pendulum oscillator. So we need to get to our sine wave, right? So to do that, we're gonna do the same thing we did with the mass on a spring, and analyze the forces. So there's two forces here that we care about. We have gravity and then the tension force in the spring. So here there's tension in the spring and that's the other force we're looking at. If we add those together, of course we get a net force, which is given down here. Um, and that corresponds to an acceleration of minus g sine theta. Now the key point here is the direction of the force. So notice that the pendulum always traces out a curved path, which means that the acceleration of the pendulum is always gonna be tangential to that curved path. So we can de describe the, the curved path by an arc length equation. Here L is the radius and L is the length of uh, the string of the pendulum. We differentiate that twice with time, we get the acceleration um, in terms of arc length. 
and we put those together using the small angle approximation, voila, we get another beautiful double dot equation, which looks very similar to the one we had before. So here, instead of x, our primary variable is theta. And theta corresponds to the angular displacement of the pendulum bob from the center rather than the horizontal displacement. So here you can see, you look at the um, angle between the string of the pendulum and the vertical rod. So here it's positive, here it's negative, positive, negative, and then it goes through zero in between. So that looks just like a sine wave again. And notice that it's very similar to the last one, except instead of uh, horizontal displacement, we have angular displacement on the y-axis that oscillates uh, with time. And then here's our period given by um, these two factors, L, the length of the period of the pendulum, and G, which is a gravitational constant, which doesn't change if you don't move anywhere. So to illustrate that length is what changes the period, not anything else, I have two pendulums of different lengths. And if I try to, if I try to initialize them with the same angular displacement, you can quickly see that the smaller pendulum has a much shorter period and this longer pendulum has a much longer period. So if you were making clocks out of these, this would be modeling a cuckoo clock because it has a shorter pendulum and it kind of swings cuckoo. And then the longer <laughs> one is a grandfather clock because it takes a lot longer to swing back and forth. So that's very exciting. We finished all of our uh, pendulum physics. So again, we get to fill in our table a little bit. We have our angular displacement as our primary variable, and that's what's oscillating with time. Our defining equation, which leads to our sine wave. Uh, the hooking constant here is the length of the pendulum. So that's the intrinsic um, variable that, change, that defines the period, which is given down here. And the two potential forms, we looked at that earlier. They're still potential and kinetic. The only difference here is that the potential is uh, the gravitational potential of the bob as it's displaced from its equilibrium position. And our kinetic is still 1 half mv squared, so it's still the kinetic energy of the moving bob. So great, OK. How do we turn that into a clock that we can actually see? How do we go from a pendulum swing to a turning of clock hands? Well, that's where the escapement comes in. So here is a model of an escapement. This wheel here is called the escape wheel, right? And it always wants to turn. It has this impulse on it, this torque on it that makes it want to turn constantly. I'll tell you why in a second, but just bear with me here for a second. Attached to this fork-shaped object is a pendulum, and so you can see that as the pendulum swings, this fork-shaped object is going to swing back and forth. So right now you can see that this tooth is engaged with, or this fork of the, of the anchor, it's called an anchor in the clock world, um, <laughs> is attached with this tooth, the tooth of this uh, escape wheel. So it's preventing the escape wheel from moving. Now as the fork shifts to the left, as the pendulum swings, it'll release the escape wheel for a split second, allow it to turn until the pendulum swings to the other side and catches it on the right side. Then it'll swing back to the left, release the wheel for a second, and catch it on the left side. So you can see in this way it kind of um, ticks the uh, wheel forward. So to see this in action, I have a little video. I can get it. Okay. So you can see engaging with the right. Do it once more. So it engages with the right, and then engages with the left, and kind of advances it forward um, in a stepwise fashion. Now here is an actual pendulum from a real clock. Here is the, uh, the anchor, and then you can see the escape wheel down here. You can only see a few feet, so that's okay. The oscillator is over here, and it's not a pendulum. Don't worry about what the oscillator is here, though. It's gonna go a little faster. Um, but just worry about the escapement, and see that we're transferring this um, flipping motion into a turning motion of the wheel. I'm um, interesting enough, too, this is where the TikTok sound comes from um, that David has in the back of his head. <laughs> so, Watch this video. You hear the ticking. See that as it swings, it allows the wheel to turn around. So the ticking comes from this um, tooth here colliding with the teeth of the escape wheel. So that's great. I can see that it wants it's turning, but why does it want to turn so badly? Well, that's where the falling weights come in. So here's our escape wheel. Here is the anchor that holds it in place, and here we have a falling weight. So the falling weight is attached to this string, right, which is wound around a drum. As the weight falls, it pulls on the string, turns the drum, and then the drum turns these gears one by one, and then eventually we get to the escape wheel. So as the wheel weight falls, it wants to turn the escape wheel. Now, if there's no anchor and all the wheels were allowed to turn freely, right, the weight would fall really fast, all the wheels would turn, and then it would be stopped pretty quickly. So that's where the anchor comes in. Not only does the anchor hold the escape wheel in place, but it holds the entire gear train of the entire clock in place while it's um, engaging. For the split second that it allows the wheel to turn, 
it allows all the wheels to turn, the weight drops just a little bit, and then it catches it on the other side. So you can see the weight falls just in like little increments, and then it also ticks the clock forward a little bit. Once we have a, a ticking uh, wheel, it's pretty easy to go from that to the right um, rotational speeds you want to get a second hand, a minute hand, and an hour hand. We just need the appropriate gear ratios. So right, say our Bob pendulum had a period of one second, we put 60 teeth on the second hand, and we would get it to turn once a minute. Then using bigger and bigger gears, we can go from a, a second hand to a minute hand and to an hour hand. So see this in action, in the video, this is actually the reflux clock, and uh, you can see the weight's falling. So notice here's the second hand. Every time it ticks forward one second, you'll see the weight drop by a little bit. And the weight won't be moving in between. So in the in-between times, you can hear the ticking again, which is very exciting. <laughs> in the in-between times, it's held by the anchor. Exciting, right? <laughs> we were able to turn the swinging of a pendulum to an anchor swinging to turning of wheels and eventually to second hands and hour hands and minute hands just as we want. So we've got a clock that makes sense to humans. So now let's go to a clock that doesn't make sense to humans but makes sense to computers. So this is something completely different. These electronic clocks are essential to computer processors. So computers see time kind of a different way that we see time. Instead of turning of clock hands, they see them as these oscillating voltage signals that have a very regular period. So these signals are used to regulate the computer's functions. Um, there's one in your phone, you know, in your computer, and you, you do use them every day even if you're not aware of it. So they're pretty uh, key to technology, even if they're hidden. Here the oscillator, instead of a pendulum, is an LC circuit. Um, the mechanism to record these oscillations, basically since we're not turning hands, I just say those oscillations are recorded in the voltage signal itself. And then to return the energy, we use a periodic input voltage so that the oscillations don't die out. So what is an LC circuit? A quick refresher, we have an inductor and a capacitor. And so for those who are too keen on electronics, essentially a capacitor is just an element that stores electrical energy, and an inductor is an element that stores magnetic energy. And then over time, the energy transfers from the capacitor to the inductor and back. So if you want, you can just think of the energy as being stored in these field lines here. And this is an animation that I'll play in a second, but you're gonna see the energy go from these field lines field lines associated with the magnetic field of the inductor, and then back again. So watch the field lines uh, go back and forth. And you see that at the end of this video, we're at an intermediate state where we have energy in both the electric field of the capacitor and the magnetic field of the inductor. So already we have come upon our two forms of energy, right? Electrical and magnetic, and we're oscillating between them. But what about a sine wave? Where's a sine wave? Well, if you use Kirchhoff's loop rules and do a derivation, and I won't quite do here, you end up with um, with Q double dot equals minus one over LC times Q. So here's a third double dot equation that looks much like our first two. Um, here the primary variable is charge rather than displacement. So this charge, um, this is charge built up on the capacitor plates. So these and this little schematic are modeled by these pluses and minuses. So you can see that over time, the charges are on the capacitor, they flow through the circuit, and then go back the, on the other side of the capacitor. And they flow back through the circuit, and then here, and then back and forth. So this time, we're gonna play it again, but watch for the moving charges. So you can see that for a split second, there's no charge on the capacitor plates, and it's all in the circuit. And when there's no charge on the capacitor plates, that corresponds to all the charge moving through the circuit, and all the energy in the magnetic field. Just to get this magnetic field, right, we just use Faraday's law of induction, so a changing current through a coil produces a magnetic field. And that's where we store that energy. So again, here's our half sine wave, time on the x-axis, and uh, our primary variable on the y-axis. In this case, the primary variable is charge built up on the capacitor. And for, all, for our purposes, charge is the same as saying uh, voltage on the capacitor. It's a built up of charge leads to a voltage difference. Uh, so they're kind of interchangeable in this case. So just think of this either as voltage across the capacitor or charge built up on the capacitor. And that's just going back and forth. The kind of equilibrium position here is zero volts, but that's again when there's no charge on the capacitor and it's all flowing through the circuit. Now the charges go from one side to the other, that's when we go from positive and negative voltage. So our uh, period here is given by this, which again looks very similar to what we had before. 
the L and the C are, um, you know, ductus and capacitance here. Notice that it doesn't, there's no Q or V or anything in this equation. So you can see that the period of the, of the LC circuit only depends on these factors which are intrinsic to the system. So once again, if you take this LC circuit wherever, it's going to have the same period because um, it only depends on the inductance and capacitance. So what about the energy loss? Well, in real life, the electrons are moving along through the circuit, and they're not unimpeded. They run into atoms, <coughs> and those atoms steal their energy and transfer um, to the surroundings as heat. So no matter what, in any real circuit, we're going to have resistance. So we model it as a resistor here, and it's continually turning the electrical energy of the atoms of the electrons into heat. So what that'll look like is we're going to see a decaying voltage signal, which will decay pretty quickly, you know, 40 milliseconds, um, if we allow the electrons to bump into all these atoms. And that's no good, because our clock will stop you know, in less than a second, and that's not going to be useful for here. So to fix that, we periodically um, return energy to the electrons with a periodic input signal. Um, so it might seem at first like, well, you need an oscillating voltage to get an oscillating voltage, kind of chicken and egg, how does that work? Well, the input, the input voltage doesn't have to be as regular of a period as the LC circuit. It just has to be quick enough that it doesn't die out before we add more energy. So we can add energy here, and then maybe a few cycles later add energy here, and then we won't die out completely. Because remember, in all these oscillators, not just the pendulum, the period of the amplitude, or the period of the oscillation doesn't depend on the amplitude. So if the amplitude dies a little bit, it's okay, our period won't be, un won't be affected, and we'll be okay. So here is all that we need to know about the capacitor. Our primary variable here is charge across the place, and that's what oscillates over time. Our defining equation is this double dot equation, which again gives us a sine wave. The hooking constant here is capacitance. I didn't include inductance because there are some electric circuits or electric clocks that don't use capacitors. They use more complicated uh, active elements and whatnot. So the real timekeeping device here is a capacitor. Natural period given by this, and remember our two energy forms are electric and magnetic. Um, once again. So that's great. Electronic clocks, I never really see them. I'm not very excited by them. With, you know, what are you thinking? What about clocks that we actually see? What about this clock, for instance? Well, here we have quartz clocks. These are all around you. These are what would allow us to carry time on your wrist and not even think twice about it. All right, so raise your hand if you're wearing a watch right now. Anyone wearing a watch? OK, take it off, if you don't mind. And then tell me if it says anything on the back. Benches? Well, it might say quartz. <laughs> okay, well mine says quartz on the back. <laughs> and I guarantee you this one also says quartz on it. I know because I went up the other day and took it off and it says quartz. <laughs> and so that shows to show you I've seen clocks all around Olin, all around, everywhere, you know, for my whole life. And they all all the cheap ones say quartz on them. <laughs> it's like we should understand how they work if that's what we're using to tell time, right? So here's how quartz box works. The harmonic oscillator here is a quartz crystal, so it's a quartz bar that's just vibrating mechanically. To record the vibrating oscillations, we use a frequency divider and a stepper motor, which we'll get to in a second. And then to return energy to the vibrating quartz crystal, we use a battery. So this is what a quartz uh, crystal looks like. So imagine you have a rectangle, right? It can either you know, stretch out like spaghetti, or it can shear like this, or it can bend up and down like this. It doesn't really matter that much for our purposes. What, how the quartz is vibrating. Um, we just need to know how it's vibrating. We just need to know that it is vibrating. Um, so to describe those vibrations, we have this kind of more engineering equation that is sort of related to Hooke's law. So we have stress, which is how much force we put on the quartz crystal, strain, which is how much it bends, and then they're related by this compliance factor, which is kind of a measure of the stiffness of the spring. So a stiffer spring will take more strain, or more stress to get an equivalent amount of uh, strain. And then if we solve this equation and do some other mumbo jumbo, we get to this frequency, which is kind of ugly. Um, there's a lot of other variables in here, and it's not too happy. I don't really see how we're going to get a sine wave from here. Um, so what do we do? Well, luckily, we don't have to worry about the mechanical vibrations of the quartz because of this handy-dandy thing called the piezoelectric effect. So essentially what this is, if you have a crystal that's piezoelectric, when you apply a mechanical strain to it, it'll develop an electric dipole. So you just mess around the crystal and the charges will separate until you get a voltage across um, the crystal. Conversely, if we apply a voltage across the crystal, we'll get it to strain, we'll get it to bend. Um, so this is very exciting. Think about it, if we have a vibrating quartz crystal that's at its equilibrium position, then it's bending, and back to equilibrium, and then bending the other way, it's going to have no charge, 
and then or no net charge, and then a net charge, and then no electric dipole, then an electric dipole, and back and forth and back and forth. So what does this sound a lot like? This sounds a lot like our capacitor, doesn't it? Where we have charge building up on the capacitor and then charge not on the capacitor in an oscillating manner. Um, so sure enough, we can just model the quartz crystal as the RLC circuit from before. Um, as physicists, we usually take, you know, we often take really complicated systems and model them as simpler systems and uh, <coughs> makes our lives a lot easier. So we have an RLC circuit here. Don't worry too much about these details, but essentially we can design this so that we um, produce the same frequency of oscillation in the electric signal as we get in the vibrating quartz. Um, and we do that by knowing the kind of parameters of the quartz and then relating those to parameters of the R, of the inductance, capacitance, and resistance. So then we get a sine wave that looks just like the one we had before. Um, the only difference here is the voltage is not across a real capacitor, it's across the plates of a quartz crystal. So how we accomplish this when we manufacture quartz is we cut a rectangular bar and then we kind of paint electrodes on the side so that it acts just like a capacitor. Um, so here we have oscillating voltage across the quartz crystal um, instead of across the capacitor. But like I said, we humans, we don't really understand time in this form. We see it as turning clock hands. So how do we go from this signal to turning clock hands? Well, that's where the stepper motor comes in. <coughs> so like I said, I saw those clocks everywhere, right? They all had this black box on the side. And I've seen those for years and years. You'd always see a cheap clock with a little black box on the side. So I figured I want to open that up and see what's inside the little black box. So I actually found, you know, like a $5 clock from Target in my house and opened it up. And sure enough, you see a quartz oscillator. So that's what's in this little uh, cylinder right here. The quartz oscillator, which produces an oscillating voltage just as our RFC circuit produces an oscillating voltage, that um, signal is sent through a coil here. And remember when we send an oscillating voltage through a coil, we get a magnetic field in the axis of the coil. So in this case, here's the axis of the coil, right? And the magnetic field is going back and forth like this. Now, that's useful because we can put a permanent magnet in the magnetic field and it's going to feel that magnetic field oscillate and want to twitch back and forth to align itself. So as the magnetic field oscillates back and forth, the, quartz, or the uh, magnet here it tries to align itself continually and ends up twitching back and forth. So this is a, another video. It's a little subtle because the only thing that's moving is a permanent <coughs> magnet. So just watch this little gear here. On the bottom, the other side is where the magnet is. And instead of seeing a turn, which you might expect it to turn, because the stepper motor kind of does it in steps, so you're going to see it flick back and forth instead of turning in a continuous way. As it flicks back and forth, though, it succeeds in turning this wheel in a more smooth fashion. If we connect this to more gears, which I took out just for simplicity's sake, we're going to see um, the gears turning and eventually there's hands. We can attach to those gears and the hands are on the other side. So let's watch this video. And luckily for us, we hear ticking once again. So notice this ticking back and forth and turning this wheel. So that's great. We turned a quartz oscillator into turning gears, which from there we just put some clock hands on there and we have a nice clock like you see here. Now there is a dinosaur in the room, unfortunately. So the frequency of our quartz crystal when we cut it is about 33,000 hertz, which is really, really fast. We don't want to send that signal through our stepper motor because then our hands are going to go 30,000 times a second and we'll be pretty hard to tell time. That's <laughs> <laughs> we'll a lot slow. So how are we going to reduce the signal to be 1 60th of hertz, which is the frequency of the second hand? That's a pretty big difference, so I mean it's a formidable task. So what we use are these fancy handy dandy flip-flops, which are electronic <laughs> devices. So for those who haven't seen flip-flops, don't worry too much about the specifics. Just think about them as a black box where we input an oscillating signal and we output an oscillating signal of exactly half the frequency. So essentially what it does is it takes a signal, stores it for a little bit, outputs, ha outputs it half a cycle later, and we end up with half the frequency. So say we put a two uh, hertz signal in, we end up with a one hertz signal coming out. You can use flip-flops for other things, but for our purposes, that's what they do. So then what do we do? We put a bunch of them together, and we continually divide the signal in half until we get to one, which is what we want. So this is what it looks like in series. Don't worry about all the specific wirings. Just pay attention to this um, schematic down here. So here's our initial input voltage. It doesn't look like a sine wave. It looks like a square wave. That's just how computers like to see it. Um, it's not that big a deal. Just remember, it's still oscillating. So we have a signal here with a constant period. After one flip-flop, you can see the period is cut in half. After two flip-flops, it's cut in half again. And after three flip-flops, the period 
cut in half a third time. So what we have is dividing by two, by two, by two. So it divides the signal by eight. So we end up with f coming in, and then f divided by eight coming out. So then we know how to divide it by two, so let's just divide it by two 15 times, and we'll get back to one. So we have 32,768 uh, hertz going down to one by using flip, uh, 15 flip-flops. Now this seem, might seem like a miraculous coincidence. When you cut cores, it's exactly two to the 15, and it works to get to one second. Well, in fact, we made it this way because um, manufacturers can cut cores in very um, precise ways, so we can cut it, as you change the thickness, it changes the frequency that it wants to vibrate at. So if you cut it at right, just the right thickness, it's gonna vibrate at just this um, frequency, and then we're gonna end up with exactly 1 60th of a hertz, and we'll get a second hand, which we can, we can then attach to a minute hand and an hour hand, and we have cheap, reliable clocks used for every day. So, that's our quartz crystal, right? Now these first four are look a little different than the other ones, and that's because they relate the mechanical vibrations and not the, uh, the electric vibrations, which is sort of more what we focused on. So don't worry too much about what these are. The hooking constant is still the compliance of the crystal, which is related to the thickness and all that. Um, so those combine together to form that sort of intrinsic ver uh, variable to the oscillators themselves that doesn't change with time or change where you bring them or whatever. So that's where we get a constant period. The two energy forms here are potential and kinetic again, but it looks pretty different from our pendulum example. So here, we have a quartz crystal that has a very strong sense of shape. So if we perturb it from that, you know, it's where it wants to be, it's gonna be like this, and it's gonna wanna go back to its original shape. So it's gonna have a potential energy stored in the crystal lattice that's gonna make it go back to its original shape. While it's going back to its original shape, it's gonna be a moving crystal, so it'll have kinetic energy stored uh, in the crystal. So again, you see a dance between potential when it's displaced, and kinetic when it's moving back to its equilibrium position. And uh, so that's a quartz crystal, it's very exciting. I didn't mention the battery, I mean you can see it in this picture. <laughs> um, so this restores energy to quartz crystal, because although they're very, they have a very high Q factor, right? so they, they take a long time to slow down, eventually they would stop because of the internal friction, so we gotta keep giving it some power. Now the reason we can make them so cheap is that it doesn't take much power at all, so this AA battery will last us a long time and uh, we don't even have to think much about it. Uh, so that's great, right? Of course, it's all around us. It's cheap, it's easy to make clocks. But there's one column that's conspicuously missing here, and that's the atomic clock. And we're about to enter the world of atoms, and as we all know, the world of atoms is governed by quantum mechanics, and that doesn't make sense to anybody, quantum mechanics. It's <laughs> <laughs> gonna get a lot kind of more hairy. Don't worry, Doc Brown was scared when he tried to understand time of class. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna be okay. Just hold on to your clocks and, and bear with them. <laughs> so time of clocks, these are really exciting. They lose one second every 30 million years, which is unimaginably precise, at least for me. That's so <laughs> precise. <laughs> so what is our harmonic oscillator here? Well, they're atoms themselves that are oscillating. How do we record their oscillations? We use some fancy electronics, which I'll describe a little later. And to return energy, we use oscillating magnetic fields. So what about atoms makes them such good timekeepers? Um, and how can we harness their power? Well, first, we have to delve into the field of magnetic resonance. So we're not going to go too deeply into this. Um, just on a qualitative level, think of atoms as little magnets. So just like our stepper motor magnet, they want to align themselves with the magnetic field. So we're also going to um, put them in the field of an oscillating magnetic field, and they're gonna to attempt to line themselves up with that magnetic field and kind of flip back and forth, just like the stepper motor does. So what makes atoms have a magnetic moment? What makes them little magnets? They don't really look like bar magnets, they're little atoms, what makes them magnetic? Well, that's where spin comes in. So spin is one of those quantum mechanical properties that nobody really knows quite what it is, um, but we know what it does. So for our purposes, spin is an intrinsic property of atoms, um, and the atom spin is responsible for its magnetic moment. So in the case here, we have the spin flipping between two values, just as the stepper motor is kind of flipping between up and down. And we call those two values spin up and spin down. So they're associated with h bar over two and minus h bar over two, which are just don't worry too much about it, it's just kind of quantum mechanical um, units for their angular momentum related to spin. For our purposes, they just you know kind of denote the two states that the atom can be in as it flips back and forth in an oscillating magnetic field. So what atoms do we use? 
in an atomic clock. We have a lot to choose from, you know? It's like 100, 114 atoms. Where are we gonna, which one are we going to use? Well, in the atomic clocks, we use rubidium and cesium. So if you look at the periodic table, what do you notice? You see that they're all, they're both of these are in the first column, so that's what they have in common. So what's special about the first column? What's special about period, or group one? So group one atoms, they have one single unpaired electron. All the other electrons are paired up and spin up, spin down pairs, and their angular momentum sort of cancels each other out, and those don't correspond to the atom's net magnetic moment. So remember, spin is what, is what creates the magnetic moment, and in this case, the only atom electron that's contributing to that, to the net magnetic moment, is that single unpaired electron. So this really simplifies things for us. We don't have to worry about all the other electrons are doing. We just have to worry about the spin of that single unpaired electron in rubidium and cesium, and that'll tell us the magnetic moment of the entire atom. So it simplifies things greatly. So what about our sine wave? I don't see any sine waves. Well, here's a sine wave. <laughs> <laughs> so here the primary variable is not quite as well defined as it was before. So remember, in quantum mechanics, every, most things are not well defined, and we talk about things with probability amplitudes rather than with definite bar of values. So that's what we have here. On the y-axis, our primary variable is the probability that the atom is in a spin-up state. So we know it's slipping from spin up to spin down, so that when it's in spin up at the top of the sine wave, there's 100% certainty that it's in the spin up state, because it's in the spin up state. Down when it's in the spin down state, there's a 0% probability it's in the spin up state, because it's clearly in the spin down state. In between though, we don't know what it's doing, okay? We can only say with some kind of probability what state it's in. So say we're in the middle line here, here we have a 50% probability that it's in the spin up state. It could be in either state, and we don't really know. Up here, when it's close to the top line, it's not quite 100%, but we're still kind of sure that it's in a spin-up state because the probability is a lot higher. And so that's what's actually oscillating, is the probability that it's in a spin-up state. Um, so that's all well and good, but it doesn't really make sense to turn a probability into you know, a physical oscillation. How do we make that drive a clock? Well, we'll see that in a second. But just keep in mind that what we can see is it going from spin-up to spin-down in a periodic fashion. And you can see that has a definite period. So that was the first element of a harmonic oscillator. Who remembers what the second element of a harmonic oscillator was, besides the sine wave? Energy. energy transfer, that's right. So let's talk about the energy of the atoms. So here is a Hamiltonian, right, which related to the energy. For all these variables with hats on them, it makes me a little scary, but just keep in mind that it's just directly related to spin here. So spin is our S value. Remember, spin really, um, gives us our magnetic moment, which is mu here. Um, and it could be either spin up or spin down. So if we're in a spin up state, we have a particular value for E. If we're in a spin down state, we have another value for E. And those are the only two energy values that we're looking at for this specific case. Now I have B down here, so this is a magnetic field that we're applying to the atoms, just to show you that it's also oscillating. So we apply an oscillating magnetic field here, and that's the term. There's also a static term that's perpendicular, you see it's K versus J. Um, and I'll describe why we need that in a second. Don't worry about that yet. So if you're not happy with equations, or you're not that much of a physics person, let's look at it in a schematic form. So here we have the hyperfine structure of cesium-133. So you might recognize ground state and excited state, but these lines might be a little less familiar to you. So note that the ground state and excited state, those are only defined by the, quantum, the principal quantum number n. So think of that as kind of like an energy category. Um, it's kind of a gross definition of how much energy the atom has, but it's not that specific. <coughs> it's not specific because it doesn't take into account spin, because we actually came up with the ground state energy in excited state before we even knew about spin. We did observe these hyperfine splits, so we saw these other energy levels and weren't quite sure what to make of them, so we gave it these spin values. So again, remember, the spin is associated with energy. So if we're in a spin up state, we have this E2 energy. If we're in a spin down state, we have this E1 energy. And in between, of course, just like any two energy levels, we have an energy transition. So photons can jump between these energy levels, or the atoms can jump between the energy levels and release the photon. So for this particular transition, the photon energy is about nine gigahertz. Um, and keep in mind, and what's interesting here is that the frequency of the photon released by this energy difference is exactly the same as the frequency that the atom oscillates between these two states. So it's in spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. Nine billion times a second, it's pretty fast. And what's really important here for our atomic clock is that this period um, defines the transition and it's a very, very specific period. So if you have a photon of you know, 10 gigahertz, it's not gonna go right through and not see this transition. Um, 
But if you have a photon of exactly this, then it will um, see this transition. And if you have an oscillating magnetic field of exactly this frequency, it'll induce resonance. So resonance means it'll start oscillating wildly. Otherwise, it won't really oscillate at all between these two states. It'll just be in one or the other. So let's define, let's summarize all that physics that we just did. The primary variable here is the electron spin, um, S. More um, precisely, it's the probability that the electron is in a spin-up state, but that was too much to fit in the box, so we can just say it's spin. Um, the natural period, of course, is the energy difference here. So Planck's constant over E2 minus E1. And then the two energy forms are spin up and spin down. So equivalently, right, it's E2 and E1. Um, and these are the spin up, spin down, the two energy values we associate with this transition. So that's great. We have an atom flipping back and forth in a magnetic field. And it's going back and forth between h bar over 2 to minus h bar over 2 between two different energies. How are we going to make this into a clock? It seems pretty hard. Well, to illustrate that, we're going to use a classical example of a magnetic dipole moment, and that is a uh, compass needle. So a compass needle, just like an atom, has a magnetic dipole moment, and it's affected by magnetic fields. So you can see I have this bar magnet here, which is, which is um, putting the compass needle in a static magnetic field. You can see right now that it's lining up with that magnetic field. You see the red part of the compass needle lining up with the white part of the static field of the bar. So I mentioned how we have a static field, and it doesn't seem really necessary. We just have one compass needle here. But in reality, of course, we have something on the order of 10 to the 23 atoms, and we need them all lined up before we oscillate them, because otherwise we'll be oscillating in all kinds of random directions, and it'll be all hard to observe. So first, we have to line them all up with the static bar magnet here. So that's great, but let's get some oscillations, huh? So it's not really twitching at all. But I am sending an oscillating uh, magnetic field through it. So you can't see in the video here, but if you look down here, you see these coils. So remember, once again, if we send an oscillating voltage signal through coils, we end up with an oscillating magnetic field. In this case, it's perpendicular to the static field. Um, but right now, I'm sending about 176 hertz in, and it's not oscillating at all. So what are we going to do? Well, let's change the frequency and see what happens. If you reduce it down to about 1.7 hertz, you can see it start to move a little bit. So now it's starting to oscillate. And that's because we found the resonant frequency of this particular magnetic dipole moment. So it wasn't oscillating at all those other frequencies, but it is going to oscillate at this very particular frequency, about 1.75 hertz. Now if we keep going and we turn it down even more, you'll see it stop oscillating. Right? So this shows you that the magnetic dipole only wants to oscillate at this very particular frequency. So that kind of tells you that that frequency is intrinsic to this particular compass needle. Um, and then atoms have a very particular magnetic dipole, or a particular frequency they want to resonate at, at too. And that frequency is given by that transition we had, that photon we had before, of about 9 billion hertz. Um, so that's cool, right? I can, uh, I can look at the compass needle and see if it's oscillating or not. Is it oscillating? Oh yeah, it kind of is. So that means that we must be operating at about 1.75 hertz. If we go down a little bit, we see it's not, not, not oscillating. Let's get to, back to oscillation. So we keep tuning this frequency until we see the oscillation. So once we see oscillations in the compass needle, we say we know exactly the frequency we're sending in. So we tune, tune, tune. Is it oscillating? Not quite. Is it oscillating? Not quite. So you see it oscillate. Once you see that start to happen right there, Boom, you know that we're at resonance. We know exactly what the frequency is that we're sending in. Um, so that's cool, right? In the kit. Um, so how do we turn that into a clock? Well, the point here is that the resonant peak of this compass needle is not particularly narrow, right? Instead of looking at that, I can just see that it says right on this frequency, um, or this function generator, 1.8 hertz. So like, why do we need to do all this mumble jumble? Where in reality, the, the, uh, the peak of the resonance the resonance peak for atoms is so very narrow that it gives us many more orders of precision than whatever instrument or device we have. So we can send in a signal and know roughly what it is, but if it, until we hit resonance, we don't know quite what it is. So the atom kind of acts as a check. So once we hit resonance in the atom, we know with extreme precision what frequency we're sending in, and that's where the precision of an atomic clock comes from. Precision that with which we know that oscillating frequency, or the frequency of the oscillating magnetic field. Um, so that's great. 
But how do we see that? So in, in this example, I can just kind of stare at this, this little compass needle and then twiddle my, my little knob here and I see what it is. And you know, I'm a human and I can do that great. But we're operating <laughs> on the order of nine gigahertz and we're using atoms. We need, you know, humans aren't enough. We need to use fancy electronics. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So the fancy electronics we're going to use is a lock-in amplifier. So this is a little confusing. Bear with me um, if you haven't seen lock-in amplifiers before. Essentially, we have two inputs and a single output. So if the two, in so if the two inputs are in phase, you know, they're oscillating and they're in phase, we get an output that is positive. If they're oscillating and they're out of phase, we're going to get a negative output. If they're, if they're not at the same frequency, they're going to kind of be going in and out of phase periodically, and that's what we're going to see coming out of the uh, lock-in amplifier. So when they're not at the same frequency, we see the beat frequency coming out of the lock-in, um, which is the difference between the two frequencies of the inputs. So how is this useful to us? Well, the two signals we're going to put in are a signal from the reference course oscillator and from an optical detector. So the crucial part here is that we have a reference course oscillator, just like we saw before, that's outputting an oscillating voltage signal that we kind of know with you know, some amount of accuracy, but not the accuracy, that, not the precision that we want. So we use this reference course oscillator to drive the signal going through the coils that the atoms are in the field of. So the reference course oscillator is going to be the same as a, is going to drive the oscillations in the coils. So this, we know that the reference course oscillator frequency is going to be the same as the driven frequency of the oscillating magnetic field. So our goal here is to make that frequency exactly the same as the resonant frequency of cesium or rubidium, right, for that hyperfine transition. So that's what our goal is. Now, how do we check if that's actually the case? Because like I said, our instruments aren't precise enough. How are we going to see if we're getting magnetic resonance from the atoms? Well, that's where the optical detector comes in. So without going, it's kind of a complicated instrument, but without going into too many details, in a simple you know, kind of way, you can think of it as measuring the photons that come out. So if it's these photons, so if the atom is resonating between these two energy levels, it's going to be continuously emitting these photons, right? If we see those photons, if we see photons of exactly nine billion gig of nine gigahertz, we're going to know that we're at resonance. Now, of course, the resonance peak has a little bit of line width, so we see a, uh, a instead of like an infinitely narrow or sharp peak, we see a, this kind of bell curve. So this plot's a little confusing because there's two curves. But keep in mind, here is the atomic resonance curve. Right at the top is exactly nine uh, gigahertz, and then here's our locking out amplifier output. So if our locking is positive. We know that our signal, our quartz oscillator is oscillating too slowly. So when we use a feedback loop, we have the lock-in amplifier tell the quartz, all right, quartz, we've got to oscillate a little faster because we want to get to resonance. So he says, quartz, all right, quartz oscillates a little faster. The quartz oscillates a little faster, but he's really excited. He wants to get to resonance really badly, and he oscillates a little too fast, and now the signal from the lock-in is negative. So now the lock-in says, all right, quartz, you're oscillating too fast, you've got to slow down. So he slows down a little bit, and then we hit zero, so boom. Our lock-in amplifier is now locked onto the resonance peak. We know that because it's uh, outputting zero here, um, and everyone's happy. Okay, it's all well and good. So we know once the lock-in is, uh, is outputting a zero, we know that the quartz oscillator is is oscillating at exactly the same frequency um, as the resonance peak of the atom, and we know with extreme precision what that frequency is, and we can pull out that voltage signal and use that to drive a clock. So that's very exciting. Now, of course, quartz is less precise than atoms, so it might stray a little bit. Now, luckily for us, the feedback loop is always going to push it back to this peak here. So if it strays a little to the left, the lock-in amplifier has this, so it is initiating this negative feedback loop, it'll send it back to the middle. And the same thing if it goes to the right, it'll send it back to the middle. So we know with pretty good confidence that we're always going to be locked on to this resonance peak here. And we're always going to know that the quartz signal is exactly 9, 9 billion, 192 million, 631,770 hertz. So this transition is really special. We actually, in 1967, a bunch of smart scientists got together in Europe, and they thought our definition of the second is not precise enough. Right now, we're using the motion of the sun and the stars to define the second, and that's pretty good, but the Earth is slowing down, and all these things are happening, and we're the star, everything's kind of moving a little bit, so that second is going to change very slightly over time. So instead, we've got to redefine the second in terms of atoms, which over the course of the universe are never going to change. So that's kind of the whole point of atoms, is that they're always the same no matter what. <laughs> they are always, and it's always going to be true. This, this transition is never going to change. Um, of course, you put it in change the temperature and change the magnetic field and all that, it might change, but... <laughs> in real life, I mean, this hyperfine structure is always going to be the case. It's always going to be here. 
And that, so this transition is very uh, closely associated with the atom itself. So in 1967, they had a big conference, and they got together, a conference on the second, they called it, and they redefined the second in terms of this exact amount, number of periods associated with the, ran the radiation associated with the hyperfine transition of the ground state of cesium-133. And that's now what the official second means. So if anyone ever asks you what a second is, you can say, yeah, this is what it is. <laughs> so that's great. One last thing I want to show is the uh, schematic of an atomic clock. So don't worry too much about the details here, except that we have our reference quartz oscillator, which is sending a signal into our oscillating into our solenoid here, which is creating our oscillating magnetic field. So that's going to look somewhat like these coils here. We're sending a signal through here. Then we get a magnetic field in this direction. This little box here contains our atoms, which are either going to be resonating or not resonating. Whether or not they're resonating is going to be picked up by this photo cell here. Our optical detector is going to send its information to the lock and amplifier, and then if we're not at resonance, it's going to tell us the quartz oscillator, so it's embedded in this feedback loop here. And then sooner or later, we're going to get to resonance, and we can pull out the frequency from this chain here and have a very, very accurate frequency. So that's great. We got to a frequency of one second every 30 million years. And it's a good thing we did so, because our little clock here, our poor little clock, is not very accurate. Um, because it's been about 55 minutes, and we're not quite at our 15 minute mark. So we don't want to rely on this for timing. We want to rely on something like this. So it's a good thing that Galileo came along and discovered the harmonic oscillator, because we got to something very special, right? <laughs> so let's conclude. All of these clocks are governed by harmonic oscillators. They're very exciting. They are these natural clocks that we have that we turn into you know, just man-made clocks just by coming up with these clever devices. But we're not creating our own time standard. Nature did that for us. So we went from a meager pendulum to an LC circuit quartz crystal to an atom itself. There's in fact a lot more that I didn't even mention. So in the 60s, they developed this watch that used a tuning fork, so uh, acoustic resonance to drive clock. And there's all kinds of pendulums and springs and all kinds of oscillators we can use um, to drive clock. So that's cool. But there's one more thing I want to talk about. Before we, um, so it's not too important, just really quickly. We actually developed a clock that was more accurate than the atomic clock in 2011. So it's even more accurate than one second every 30 million years. And instead of using something on Earth, we use stars. We use pulsars to tell time. So what pulsars are, if you haven't seen them before, they're just stars that rotate really fast and emit pulses of light in a single direction. So they're just like kind of celestial lighthouses. So this is what they look like in kind of schematic diagram. See, all of a sudden we see a bright flash of light when they're pointed towards us. So to be you know, doing this really fast, and we see pulses of light. Through a telescope, Pulses look like this, so we just see a blinking star in the sky, a little blinking dot. And in 2011, again in Europe, some smart scientists came up with a clock that used that pulsing uh, light, and this clock was even more precise than the most precise atomic clock we had at the time. So right now, the most precise time ever is given by these pulsars, which is kind of crazy, because for me that just underscores the fact that all these oscillators are all very natural. Right? These are stars in the middle of outer space. Clearly we didn't make these, clearly they're natural. And yet they have such an accurate time standard that we can you know, not lose one second every 30 million years of longer. Um, and that's because stars, you know, they don't encounter much friction at all out in space, and they're very steady, right? Even more, well not, they're not more steady than atoms, but they're, they're pretty steady. So. <laughs> <laughs> much more steady than we could come just by you know, making some whatever device that somebody So that's, that's a box for you. Thank you very much. Thank you all my physics majors. It's been a, it's been a good ride. Thank you everyone for coming to my practice talks. Very, very helpful. Maybe a lot less bumbly today. Um, thank you Cindy and Melissa, my faculty advisors, and Patricia Jackson and Shaw, my student advisors, Bruce Duffy helping with the technology. I feel really cool holding these little kind of gizmos. Um, my mom and my sister Bessie, it's too bad they couldn't make it out. They're trapped in the snow in New Jersey. Um, and of course, Mark Zock for first getting me psyched about clocks and for giving me the illustrious task of winding the clocks in Goodsell Observatory. So it's, it's very important. You know, the clocks would stop if somebody didn't wind them. So. <laughs> <laughs> As we learned today, so it's a good thing. I feel very responsible. Okay, any questions?
atomic clocks with passing atomic clocks. Um, in reality, to get atomic resonance, or to get magnetic resonance in these atoms, you need to create a population inversion, so just like in lasers. If you have an equal amount of atoms in the spin-up state and the spin-down state, you're not going to see any resonance, even if they are flipping back and forth. So you need to get more in the spin-up state than in the spin-down state for that to happen. Um, and that's actually also how we detect them. So um, when we see resonance, we're going to... So we're constantly pumping them, optical pumping, to get them in that population inversion. Um, so then, at, if they are transitioning, we're going to absorb more of that pumping light because they're all of a sudden there's going to be more in the spin-down state. And then we're going to see that redu reduction in uh, transmission of that light as kind of an indication that we're at resonance. If we're not at resonance, we're going to have more in the spin-up state and it's going to take relatively less pumping light. So we're going to see um, more transmitted of that pumping light through the atoms. And, um, and so it's going to be an indication that there's no resonance. So I, I, I think it has to do something with achieving uh, population inversions, which is harder to do when we have fewer atoms. Um, it clearly has to do with the hyperfine structure, which although these all have one single valence electron, their hyperfine structures are going to be very different. And I guess the cesium one just, just works for us. Um, cesium is the one that we used in fine second. Yeah, so that was actually decided you know, thousands of years ago in ancient Babylonia or whatever, somewhere in the days. <laughs> they, decided, you know, they decided on a calendar that was adapted more or less, but it's more or less the same now. And they divided up the time into um, 24 hours and 60 minutes and 60 seconds and um, whatnot. So when we defined the second, we already had one that worked for everyone. We weren't just going to change that number because that would throw everyone off, right? So what we did was we saw this transition and we saw that it takes exactly nine billion, 192 million, blah, 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 that many um, cycles to complete exactly one second as it was previously defined. So all we did is like, was shift kind of what's underneath the second. This time length is essentially the same. So they, they used that number of periods of that radiation um, so that it matched up with the previous second. So it's still the same as the previous second, but it's not going to change over thousands of years as the Earth slows down or whatever. So it's going to always be the same as the ephemeral second is what it used to be called. The ephemeral second is today. So it's just kind of a more standard second. But we didn't know. We didn't, we didn't redefine the second or anything. We just kind of like made it more standard. Oh, Christopher. So it seemed like on the pendulum clock, you need to maintain a certain amplitude so the like anchor thing would release the wheel. <laughs> How does that amplitude maintain? Um, right. So I said before that the amplitude, it also the amplitude is going to change the period even though that's not what Galileo thought. So that's because you have to use a small angle approximation to get that equation. Um, so to have any kind of accurate pendulum clock, you need to keep the um, amplitude the same. <coughs> so there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, to actually input energy back to the pendulum, which you notice I didn't really talk about. Um, in general, pendulums are attached to the rocker by a kind of spring. So imagine you just have like a thin piece of steel or some kind of metal that's connecting the pendulum uh, to the rocker. And then what we're doing, the escape wheel off of the teeth are really kind of designed in a very particular way so that not only do they catch with the anchor, but they kind of push the anchor out a little bit. So each turn, maybe it'll be helpful to go back to the So each turn, um, instead of just getting caught, they push the, uh, okay, so they, these teeth wouldn't, achieve that, but they push the anchor out and that bends the spring that's connecting the pendulum so that the spring is then storing a little bit of elastic energy and that is transferred to the pendulum each swing. Um, and then of course it's a little nuanced how you get exactly the right amount of energy to the pendulum to get it to keep the same period. Um, but that's why clockmakers have so much fun because it's a lot of, it's very precise and hard to, you know, designing each little tooth exactly right so that it pushes the pendulum out just the right amount each swing. So in that case, it's kind of the same as like pushing a kid on a swing. You have to push them just the right amount at just the right time. So in the case of a pendulum, you're bending the spring right when it's all the way at the side of its um, swing. So you put it here, and then it bends here, it bends here. So you're kind of just like just like a kid on a swing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.